Do I have to give good customer support to people I don't like? That's what we're going to talk about today. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Joseph Campbell. Boy, that's where Star Wars kept that whole Luke Skywalker cave thing going on. Today, we're going to finish our conversation about the book by Joe Polish, What's In It For Them? Nine Genius Networking Principles to Get You What You Want by Helping Others Get What They Want. Again, I really like this book. I wish I would have wrote this book, but it's about making genuine connections with people. And I think, or at least it looks like, that when you go into a store, no one's willing to help. I walked into a main store the other day, and it was like death in there. The store lights weren't turned on. The music wasn't turned on. The boxes were in the aisles. They weren't even putting things away. And the person at the register had no care about helping any of us check out. It was a little bit disappointing. We felt ignored. We felt like there was no help. I had some questions. I couldn't get answered. So I ended up walking out of there. If these stores hope to keep working, we have to learn how to make connections with people. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are like, this job is not my forever job. I don't really care what kind of job I do. Tell you what, you are never going to find that amazing forever job if you don't get this job right. We have to all start somewhere. And as we start building connections like he talks about in this book, our life will start to go in the right direction. And this is coming in about being brave. There are times where there are people you're not going to want to talk to. There are times when there are situations you're not going to want to say because the answer you're going to have to give someone is hard. There are situations where the person is going to yell at you, want to speak to your supervisor, want to talk to the head of the company, and you just know what's coming. (laughs) In those situations, by the way, this is a Jill tip. Go talk to your boss first. Tell them, by the way, I'm going to call Bob back. He's super mad and he's going to want to talk to you. Just letting you know. And bosses appreciate it when you don't blindside them. The real reward comes in when you're dealing with the people who are in that cave of fear. The nice people, I'm not saying anything bad about nice people. It's great to work with, but when you can solve a problem for a tricky person, that's how I became a team lead in the company when I was working for Microsoft. Because I was able to make unhappy people who didn't want to be happy, happy. I was able to solve difficult problems, not just the easy ones. And that's why I was promoted to where I was, because I was able to take those tricky situations. Give you an example of one. I had a person who would swear at my team person. Our rule was, if someone swears at you, you tell them, I have to hang up now. You hang up on him. Next time he calls, wants to speak to the supervisor. That was me. So I get on the phone. He swears at me. I hang up. Calls in again, swears at me. I hang up. I say, just so you know, every time you swear, I'm going to hang up on you. Are you willing to have a conversation where we can talk without you swearing at me? Yes. It was a simple solution. He was mad. He was ranting, even though he wasn't cussing. And in the process of him just yelling at me, flat out yelling me, I slowly but surely on the call got him to actually fix the problem. He wouldn't listen to my agent who was going to tell him this, but he did listen to me and we solved the problem. And he wrote a glowing email to the company about me helping this person. So the cave of fear is where the treasure is. (laughs) So anyway, keep in mind that sometimes those difficult situations are in the end the most rewarding ones. Then be useful to people. You're going to be grateful for those hard situations. Remember, hard situations, difficult people make you better. Happy, easy people, they don't make you better. They don't challenge you. They don't make you come up with more creative ideas. It's the difficult people that do. So you should be grateful for them because they're making you better. And when you get better, you're more valuable. And that's going to start creating this loop of you being useful, grateful for them, and valuable, more and more valuable. And as you become more and more valuable, you will become more important in your company or whatever relationship you're in. You will start seeing your self-image as higher Because you realize I'm the person who solves the difficult problems. I'm the person people go to when they have something they can't solve. And then the last step is he says, treat others as they would love to be treated. You know, that's always the statement in the Bible that it says, treat other people as you want to be treated. And of course, that's a theological issue about grace, mercy, and compassion. This is about 
personal likes and dislikes, whether they're an introvert or an extrovert, whether they're a person who wants to be told things this way or that way, whether they want solutions that are practical, where they want solutions from a tip sheet, or they want someone to walk them through something, whatever it is you're wanting to do, find out the way that they want to do things. I'm the kind of person who does not like to be walked through something. Send me a document, I'll follow through with it, and I'll look to it and see if I can do it. My friend, she likes it when you go through and help her step by step, when you show her exactly what it is you need to do. It's not my style, but that's how she likes to be helped. Once you start learning whether this person's a customer, your boss, your best friend, your spouse, your children, what makes them tick? And again, building that connection, that's the important thing because he says in the end, remember, you're not your customer. So just like my teammate who was perplexed of how this woman doesn't know how to do this thing, he knows how to do that thing. She is not him. Is that a right sentence? But anyway, they're not the same people. Learn about what that person needs. This is really important. You are not your own customer. Again, being curious, asking questions, learning what's in it for them, learning what their pain is, and developing that connection in an authentic way is going to help you know that. And you will be able to treat them as they want to be treated, not as how you want to be treated. And again, think of it this way. If you're having this particular situation, I am great with computers. I am terrible with taxes and legal stuff. When I go in and have to talk to someone about this, I want someone who's going to talk to me and help me in a way that I understand, not in a way they, as a lawyer or a tax preparer, whatever they are, understands. And he says, don't be too formal about things. Be fun. Keep it on the right level. I mean, there are times when you have to be formal. One of the things about me is I'm not a formal person. I used to go out to customers and I had my little suit. I must have looked like the most uncomfortable human being on the planet. Everyone knew I don't wear suits. So I started realizing it. People want me out there because of my expertise, not because of what clothes I'm wearing. And I learned to be less formal. And you know what? It ended up building more rapport with people. Because when I would actually go talk to medical staff, they're in scrubs, they don't even have to worry about it. They didn't care if I was in a suit or not in a suit. The people who think you have to wear a suit to be impressive with them are trying to put on a power play at times. You don't have to necessarily do that. Keep your language informal, keep your personality informal, not too informal on either side, but enough where you just seem like a real human being. And then he says, be memorable in a positive way. You're an exciting person. You're not a boring person. You maybe say funny things if you have the ability to be funny, or you make impressions on people in a different way. I know coworkers I've had who have exciting adventures in life or are amazing musicians. And there's something about you amazing. Be memorable in that amazing way. And he says that you can also even take improv class. I suggested it to my teammates all the time. I think improv is one of the greatest things you can do. It makes you work together as a team. If you do this with your team, it makes you think on your feet. And the number one rule of improv is always say yes. If you can take a class together, it'll make you a better human being. And then in the end, he says, you have to learn true appreciation for people, even if they're not the kind of person you tend to appreciate. So many people go unappreciated. So many people feel unappreciated. And if you can be that one person, true appreciation, authentic appreciation, you find the thing that will build the relationship with you. I had to meet with someone and he was the brain guy and he had his own office. He had his own research. Nobody wanted to talk to him because he was intimidating. And I was supposed to go I mean, I was being sent to go talk to the brain guy because everyone else was afraid to go talk to the brain guy. I'm not even in that company. I'm a contractor, but I was sent to talk to the brain guy. And you know what? He was telling me, he goes, yeah, no one really likes me here. No one explained to me the software and what it does because everyone's so afraid of me. And I get it. I'm intimidating. I know I have some personality flaws here. And I said, you know, I get that. But if they had a relative, who had brain cancer, if they had someone who had a brain disorder, you'd be the first person they talked to. 
your abilities in this research make you stand out across the world. And I get it. Not everyone can be approachable, but you are that guy who knows more about this than anyone almost on the planet. And it warmed him up. And again, I wasn't trying to just be sunny to him to, I don't know, be fake with him. I said something I found in him. I found the one thing he was proud of that he admired about himself, even though he knew he had shortcomings. And it warmed our relationship right up. And we were able to talk about about the software and why his team had to use it. He suggests that even good products need marketing, which means even if you're a good product, you still have to sell yourself in a way. You still have to sell whatever it is you're trying to do, even if it's the right thing, the right message. Everything needs that positive advertisement message to it. Again, not fake, but just remember, value, he says, depends on urgency, being able to deliver value, he says, on the spot, being useful, and just doing things. This is the important way to go. And he says that in the end, we should get to being as close to people as possible. If we can meet with people in person, meet with people in person. I have found this so valuable, so funny. I was trying to convince somebody that meeting people in person was the most valuable thing. And I dragged her around and we were talking to this group of researchers. And this lady was scowling at me in the back of the room. And I said, hey, I just noticed you're kind of giving me the evil eye back there. You know, what's happening? And she said, well, your software is all screwed up. It's wrong. And I said, okay, well, let's just take a look at it. Oh, we can flip that switch if you don't like it looking this way. We can make it look this way. Oh, and she hugged me when it was my last day and said that because the software was finally working for her, it changed her whole workday around. You don't catch that on Zoom meetings. And then all of a sudden, boom, there was a pandemic and no one was meeting in person anymore. But if you can't meet in person, make your Zoom meetings as in-person feeling as you possibly can. I know we can't always do it. I work remotely from 1,600 miles away. So I try to be as present in meetings as I possibly can to make it feel like I'm right there. But if you have the ability, meet in person. Also says, try to treat every conversation like it's crucial. You never know when something becomes important. So just don't toss off conversations, ignore what people are saying, you know, zone out in a meeting. You never know when something important is about to happen. And two, you will make people feel important if, regardless of what the topic of the meeting is, you are there, you're making people feel special, you feel like you have a connection with people. And if you're sort of just droning on in a meeting and not paying attention, it's probably not going to help much. He says in the end, in writing this book, he realizes people want connection. They want to feel special. They want to feel cared about. They want to feel that their problems matter and can be solved. They want to feel like the people on the other side of the phone call, the Zoom meeting, the email, and are invested in solving their problems. All right. So that's the book. I hope it was interesting for you. I really like this book. And I recommend reading it if you're looking for ways to connect to people in a genuine way. I think people feel so disconnected right now. And it all starts with each of us learning how to connect again. So my challenge to you is try to think of someone who's really difficult in your life, someone you don't like dealing with, someone who you don't want to spend time with or help. Can you write down 10 traits about them? that make them valuable, that makes them someone people like to connect with, that makes them someone who is worthy of getting the kind of attention and care you could give them. I've met people who are the biggest jerks on the planet, but you know what? They care about humanity like nobody else cares about humanity. So try it yourself. Try to figure out what makes that person tip. Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. I have two other podcasts, Small Steps with God, which is exactly like this podcast, but religious topics and the Bible in Small Steps, where we're going to go through step by step and talk about the Bible a chapter at a time, slow roll through the Bible. And what's coming soon, 
and you can look at it if you want to, is A Better Life in Small Steps. It's a place where you can see all my podcasts. Eventually, this is going to be the central network for these podcasts and a blog, giving you steps on a more frequent basis about how you can make your life better. And remember, walking through the cave of fear with difficult people starts with small steps because who would want to take large steps in a cave of fear? 